all the new joinees. Okay, anyway, uh, good evening, uh, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's webinar on the changing role of patient engagement in research. Uh, my name is Punari Kurtipati. I'm a research management professional based at LV Prasad I Institute um, and uh, joining with us today uh, is a, a true leader in the field of patient engagement I must say the uh, CEO and founder of Patients Engage which is a pioneering platform dedicated to uh, empowering patients and caregivers through uh, knowledge sharing support and advocacy uh, before we talk more about uh, Patients Engage and Aparna, I'd just like to take a few minutes to introduce IHOPE uh, to those of you that have joined us for the first time today. IHOPE, or Indian Health Outcomes Public Health and Economics Research Center, is a multi-institutional collaboration between LV Prasad I Institute, IIM Ahmedabad, and uh, uh, Indian Institute of Public Health Hyderabad. And uh, besides active research in the areas of clinical research, public health research, and health economics, I hope uh, is also dedicated to um, uh, shaping health policy in the country through generation of uh, knowledge-based evidence. And uh, these webinar series are a part of, uh, uh, I hope, engagement uh, with larger stakeholders. Um, so, yeah, coming back to uh, Patients Engage uh, and Aparna, who's our uh, guest speaker for today. Um, Patients Engage was established in 2014, and it advocates for patients and caregivers uh, to be treated as, not treated is the, not the right word, to be seen as stakeholders and partners in healthcare in the country. And uh, if you um, look at uh, the About Us section of the website, I think uh, uh, you would know that Aparna's foray into this area happened through her own journey and difficulties of not finding the correct information and support needed uh, you know, for her and her family members to navigate the difficult uh, healthcare uh, landscape in the country. And to me, I think that explains the dedication and uh, uh, passion that uh, she brings to this work. And I have the good fortune of working with Aparna uh, over the past couple of years through I Hope. And every time I speak to her, I, I must say, I mean, as a basic researcher, there are, I mean, every time I speak to her, there's a new perspective that I, I take back. Uh, and um, Patients Engage, I think, as a platform has a monthly, uh, I think, viewership of about one lakh uh, 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 individuals per month across its different social media platforms. And that in itself is a testament to the significance of the work that she does. Um, and I think these uh, through this platform, what Aparna tries to do is not only to help patients navigate their healthcare journeys better, but I think this platform also uh, acts as a I mean, it, it also acts as a platform to sort of spark meaningful conversations on uh, around the role of patient engagement itself in uh, maybe shaping the future of healthcare landscape in the country in its various uh, facets. And uh, so, thank you, Aparna, for 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 uh, thinking of this idea and coming coming up with such an important platform in area that is truly lacking in the country. And uh, in today's webinar. Um, Aparna is going to take us uh, through, uh, I think, the changing role of uh, patient engagement um, in research. And uh, she has a decade of experience of working with patients and patient leaders in the country. And she's going to bring her insights on this uh, important topic today. So uh, before I call Aparna uh, uh, to uh, start her presentation, I would request all the audience to uh, please actively engage uh, in the conversation today by actively posting your, uh, you know, your comments, your questions uh, uh, for us uh, in the chat box throughout the webinar. Uh, so without uh, further delay, uh, Aparna, I request you to please uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Panari, for your kind words and for, um, I think sometimes I struggle to articulate what all we do, uh, but I think you've captured that quite well. Uh, let me quickly, so today, um, I think you will see, and you see that everywhere, uh, the three pillars are inform, engage, empower patients and caregivers. Um, and we uh, are essentially an online platform for patients, building health literacy around chronic disease management for patients and caregivers, but not just leveraging 
on the insights provided by healthcare providers uh, or information from them, but also from the lived experiences of people, which uh, makes them experts in their healthcare as well. Or in and you know that's an important source of information for others in that position. Um, and and that's what we try and uh, bring together and harness and uh, figure out the gaps in or the challenges they face and try and plug that gap with conversations, with information, uh, et cetera. Um, and um, I think there are two parts of the uh, empowerment. One is at an individual level, patients and caregivers, when I say caregivers, I mean family caregivers, should feel empowered to handle the care that is required for their own health um, and as well as navigate the healthcare system. But we also, uh, as Ponari said, we strongly advocate for patients to be seen as meaningful contributors uh, and partners in healthcare uh, and you know, to be actively working with the healthcare ecosystem uh, and not just be seen as beneficiaries and recipients of care. So that's, that's something that uh, you know, we are very passionate about. Um, as I said, lived experience journeys are at the center of our content and advocacy strategy. And it is through active listening to these that we understand where the gaps are in health, either in healthcare or you know what can be, or in the gaps in information that is needed. Um, and we have, I think, over a thousand personal voices across, uh, I think across more than 75 different conditions on the website. We've been working with IHOPE over for over two years now, and there we've largely focused on eye related uh, uh, information. But uh, we've also started covering the impact of you know the the linkages between uh, uh, eye health and other conditions as well. And our real focus is always what can be done and what information will help people uh, improve their quality of life. Uh, because again, that's something that we see as a big gap, uh, the lack of focus on rehabilitative, psychosocial and supportive care as well, uh, which goes beyond the typical uh, medical uh, or the clinical field. Um, the reason for that is that if you look at chronic disease management, uh, and this is just, uh, you know, kind of we try to put it on a single slide, uh, but in reality, it is much more complicated than this and has many more loops. But nine, more than 95% of chronic disease management happens outside the clinical arena. The little blue shadings are where people are interacting with the, uh, you know, the clinicians the, or any uh, healthcare professional. The rest of the time, they are, are managing healthcare on their own. Uh, and that's really what we're trying to capture in this diagram. And therefore, what you need to remember is that the patient's journey and what they're facing and what a disease means to them is much more than what uh, they are able to share in a consultation with a medical professional or with a, even a support uh, uh, professional. Um, so we've kind of also leveraged all of that information into engagements that we do in terms of putting together patient advisory boards for um, pharmaceutical companies, uh, we are amplifying patient groups that are there, sometimes helping them uh, set up patient groups. Uh, we do projects which bring together insights from patients, again, leveraging on our understanding of lived experiences. Um, we advocate for why patients should be meaningfully involved. And now that is also a WHO uh, you know, kind of focus for meaningful involvement of persons living with uh, NCDs. Um, and multiple uh, long-term conditions. So that's, again, something that we are constantly advocating for in different forum, why they should be uh, you know, seen and actively engaged right from the beginning, apart from our work on health literacy. We've also worked with the IHOPE on bringing patients into clinical guideline committees. We worked uh, with National Cancer Grid on some projects of, again, bringing in uh, the patient or caregiver perspective into their research as well. Uh, so, you know, those are some of the things we are uh, actively trying to do. Uh, but I think, that, as you will see, there's a lot more that needs to be done and can be done. <clears throat> so as Ponari said, I think any time, please do 
post your questions. And Sonari, if you think the question makes sense along the way, I'm happy to do it. Otherwise, we can take it at the end of the session. Um, so, in you know, patient is typically being seen, especially for researchers, patient is a source of data. And that's something that whether it's a qualitative study, whether it is a quantitative study, essentially patients have been perceived to be uh, sources of data, right? And that is really what patient engagement is not. Um, I think that is what, uh, so I was looking for a appropriate definition and I think Harrington et al. 2020 says that patient engagement is the active, meaningful, and collaborative interaction between patients and researchers across all stages of the research process, where research decision-making is guided by patients' contributions as partners, recognizing their specific experiences, values, and expertise. And you know, while it may seem, uh, you know, how can a patient in get involved early on, the real value we are seeing more and more, and you will see in some of the examples, uh, is coming when patients are involved early in the cycle and not uh, at the fag end. Um, so why is that becoming a uh, factor, right? And this is, uh, it's what, I think the key question that really comes is, are you asking the right questions? Are you researching the right topics? And what is the relevance of that? There is the pure scientific, curiosity, but beyond that, if you're looking for implementation in the real world, then you need to, you know, you need to focus on what matters to patients and the outcomes that matters to patients. Um, we've also seen and some of the, I mean, we've tr I've tried to find examples for some of these as well uh, in the short time we have, uh, but the idea is really to spark some interest in this. Um, there are ways, again, patient input early into this discussions or in the uh, design has led to better study design, has led to better instruments. It leads to uh, improvement of recruitment and reduction of attrition. Um, and in a country like India, I think it will also help build trust uh, in the entire research process. Uh, the key thing really is that you get an earlier insight into real world evidence. And I think the whole the, the point also is to remember that patients are experts in their lived experience. I think that is something that uh, we often uh, uh, kind of don't think of them as experts. We see them as victims. We see them as, uh, you know, kind of struggling with their journey, but they do learn from that and they do become experts in, because of uh, that lived experience. And I think finally, and not the least, uh, it is really about being ethical, right? Because uh, as based on the HIV movement, based on the disability movement, the key thing is nothing about us without us. So why should all of this work happen without uh, involving the key stakeholders? Um, and, you know, is the research really meeting the needs of uh, the key uh, stakeholder as well? So, um, so few examples, uh, um, surveillance. So this was a, a surveillance imaging modality for breast cancer assessment. Uh, and this was to compare the effectiveness of mammography to mammography plus breast MRI um, for those with a personal history of the disease. So the, the green boxes are what the researchers said and the blue is what the patient advocates said. Uh, so we did not initially plan for patient partners to attend focus groups. Um, however, when we hosted our first focus group, it became evident uh, that the patient partners and the patient co-investigators were able to make the connection with the participants. Um, and that developed a sense of trust uh, and made them less nervous, right? And this is exactly what uh, the patient participant, uh, the a patient uh, advocacy uh, advocate also says is by sharing that we also were patients and explaining what would happen, the nervous participant was reassured and ready to contribute. Um, and then somebody was making doodles, uh, and again, you know, they they knew how to make a gentle comment about it, and then she opened up about how painful mammograms are, and leading to an entire discussion on anxiety of. Uh, imaging and how you can handle that, right? Uh, the other thing that the researchers say is that they had not looked at mortality as a main outcome, 
and it was the patient input which helped them explain why for patients mortality is often not the significant outcome because anyway it has limited uh, you know the i mean the chances of it are relatively low and other outcomes such as unnecessary diagnostic procedures are very important to patients so i think again um, um, you know the other thing that came up on the same study was about a year into the study and um, and when the patient uh, they were again involved in the conversation uh, and they basically were asked whether they would be willing to do a panel discussion in front of a broad audience and then they did have to think about you know what would happen if that information was shared on a public platform when somebody searched their name and it was determined that they had breast cancer and as somebody who publishes a lot of uh, lived experience this is something that we are constantly uh, you know sometimes even counseling patients who are ready to share as to whether it's appropriate for them to share not appropriate for them to share letting them think about it um letting them be anonymous uh, uh you know and and because sometimes sharing has consequences right so um and while i think eventually they did go ahead and share but i think it's also something to remember that and we'll probably talk a little bit about it that in different cultural settings and different groups uh this may need to be navigated differently so uh but i think the point really is that um you know these are factors to consider when you're involving patients in the research process um there was another study uh which is on uh, metastatic breast cancer and the question that when they understood the lived experience and visualized the person uh one of the things they realized was that it was not just about what the tumor markers were saying uh what people wanted to focus on was the burden of symptoms what does the you know what is the impact on their work situation on their social activities on their leisure activities and how can they design uh you know trials which do not cause additional burdens um and it was again you know because if you have somebody who's been through it as part of the conversation then it helps people relax and share uh, about their disease and you also realize how as a researcher um it it is uh, i mean you you really don't understand the full picture and we found this in so many of the focus groups we've done with patients is that it it, it can be a throwaway sentence right like for instance uh, a few weeks back or months back we were doing a study and with dme and dr patients uh, uh, and uh, the fact that somebody said that um, they go to sleep not not knowing whether they'll wake up with their eyesight intact tomorrow morning right so uh, it's something that really hits you uh, or the fact that they can't read their whatsapp messages and they must rely on uh, a family member to help them navigate even basic messages that come so and that of influence we'll see that but that's something to keep in mind even in terms of the entire process of getting consent of getting for them to feel comfortable to participate in the study etc so while technology is helpful we need to figure out how to navigate to, around that as well um from a research from a patient perspective um you know she said that uh, she was uh, happy to participate in this uh, she did say that she was not sure if she had enough scientific knowledge but she was passionate about it because she had secondary breast cancer and she didn't want her daughter uh, in future to have to have to deal with this right so um another study which was on uh, which is a huge study and probably one of the more comprehensive studies uh, on impaired awareness on hypoglycemia and again here the uh, objective was to reduce the burden and consequences of hypoglycemia and to uh, you know kind of again tackle these ch challenges through a comprehensive multi level approach um and again they realized that uh, oh. it wasn't just about numbers falling it was about how that incident of hypoglycemia affected the person sorry can somebody 
whoever it is, can they mute themselves? So, um, so it's, you know, if you have a hypo incident uh, in the middle of the night, it's not, the person doesn't just get up, uh, pop a, you know, a glass of juice and then go back to sleep. It, it, they struggle to go back to sleep. They're anxious. They worry about the effect of the lack of sleep on the next day at work. Sometimes overcorrection leads to hyperglycemia and, you know, there are cases where it affects their social relationships. So, there is a whole multitude of things that comes up and you have to, you always remember that you're dealing with the person and not just the measure. Um, this study also found that the inputs from the patients enriched the research. They could get more diversity because then the patients led, went out into their support groups and got other patients, which they would otherwise not have been able to access. Uh, so it's, what we are seeing in some of these designs is that you get patients through the standard route, um, but you're also getting patients through the support groups and the patient networks. Um, there's also, uh, you know, and they also looked at hybrid using both virtual and, uh, and that's, I think, going to stay because that gives more flexibility. It allows for wider coverage of, uh, uh, you know, uh, participants uh, for the research studies. Uh, the other thing that came up was that whenever, and we do this all the time, right? Whenever we talk to a new patient and something new comes up, we go back to a few people that we sound out on and, you know, they called it the sense check, but we do the same. And then they also use the uh, patient advisory council back to get inputs on priorities, right? Are those themes important? Is this a one-off? Is this something that needs to be looked at? Um, the other input of this one is, you know, uh, reviewing the questionnaires, reviewing the information sheets. Uh, are they explaining stuff in a language that people can understand? Are the questions too long? Uh, do they make sense? Um, and in, in terms of questions, I think probably comes up later as well. We leave that for now. Um, the other interesting one was psoriasis uh, study in uh, Europe where they found that um, it was not, um, this was a different endpoint that came up. And what they realized was that to the um, quality of life was a primary endpoint, not the psoriasis and severity index. Um, and they didn't care about the index. It's what, what it was the effect on the quality of life. And therefore what came up was the location of the plaque uh, was more important. And uh, that made the biggest uh, impact on the quality of life. Um, in Canada, they have, uh, you know, done a study again using patients right from the beginning uh, on a work stream, which looks at how to provide culturally competent, social, emotional, and psychological support to retinoblastoma patients uh, at diagnosis and beyond. And they they realize they need to look at not just the patients and survivors, but also the parents because they get affected as well. Um, there's another study, which is probably the most significant study to date, which looks at, it involves the larger UK public and actually came up with the areas of priorities for ophthalmo, uh, ophthalmology research. This is the James Lind Alliance site loss and vision priority. Um, as I said, there's always inputs into plain language summaries. There's reduced attrition because they are designed well. There's a buy-in, there's a trust, they don't drop off. Um, the other area where I think there's a lot of work happening with patients right from the beginning is rare disease. And we are seeing that even in India. So there are uh, you know small uh, groups of patients who are actively working in this. Uh, in India, it is for uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. There are... Uh, um, I think the a few others, yeah. I forget the names of those diseases. Um, sorry. So um, I think I'll, I'm coming to a quick thing and then we'll get into questions. I think one of the challenges that patients or the process is facing is that often the language that is there is full of jargon, right? So when you say instruments, um, to a patient, it feels like, oh, is there a scalpel or something, right? So I think it's about, or you talk of patient reported outcomes, um, 
So the, often the language is filled with jargon in the documentation that's shared in the in the discussions that happen. So a conscious effort needs to be made to uh, you know make sure that they feel included and uh, and you know an effort and they should not feel awkward about saying uh, can you explain that in plain English, right? And that's something that doesn't come easy again in an Indian setup. Uh, so that's something that will need to be worked at. Uh, we continuously find, and you know, even in these conversations that are there on this, is there are questionnaires which are hugely dated, right? So for instance, to determine um, brain fog after hypoglycemia, one of the questions that was there in one of these standardized questionnaires was to find a number in a telephone, right? And it's not relevant, so you need to modify that. Or even the blessed score for dementia still says, can you remember a short shopping list? Um, again, I think forget dementia, most of us don't remember shopping lists, right? We all use our phones. Um, the other thing we found when we were engaging patients in any of these studies, whether it's the clinical guideline or any, any of the other studies, is the extensive reading that is sometimes required. So you need to figure out who is capable of it or what are the solutions, especially when you have a disability, like you have an eye condition and you are you know, uh, not going to be able to read that as much. You have dry eyes, you have uh, uh, restricted vision, et cetera. So what are the accessibility options that you can provide? Uh, language, again, if we truly want representation and diversity, how do you handle the language issue in, um, in India? Um, we had, in one of the conversations we had, uh, there was a cancer survivor, there was uh, uh, someone with an autoimmune condition who said that I have brain fog, so I can only read in small chunks, I can't sit and, you know, read for long periods of time together. So those are things that we will need to factor in when we bring in patients, but, um, you know, it's all doable, it just needs to be managed. Um, similarly, I think one of the big issues continues to be, and this is even globally, but there is one is there is no awareness on all sides as to what is what patients can bring to the table and what uh, what the role of patient engagement is or can be. And the other thing is even when we do bring them in, there is no clear clarity on what the role definition is. Uh, and sometimes we bring in them in for a transaction and then they don't know whether they'll get called back in two weeks time, two months time, six months time, uh, will they see eventually the document they gave their inputs on or not? Uh, so all of these things I think do matter uh, in terms of them feeling really part of the process rather than just um, a one-off engagement or a tokenistic one. Um, and I think technology is both a challenge as well as uh, an opportunity. So again, it needs to be navigated through. We had somebody with uh, for one of the projects with DME who was older and really struggled and poor eyesight really struggled with uh, even being able to see his emails or his messages and uh, you know kind of say that he's okay with it or not. So he was very dependent on his uh, family support. Um, so as I said, we work with patients, caregivers, patient groups, and they are all stepping up. We are seeing this even in India where they are sharing their experiences, they're setting up support groups, they are doing on-ground um, awareness campaigns, they're providing emotional support to other patients and caregivers, they are wanting to be part of various committees and contribute to improved healthcare outcomes. Um, so I guess the question really is to the community of researchers here is how are you going to work with patients, right? Um, so on that, I will stop and, uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Aparna. That, uh, uh, that's very nice, uh, uh, you know, case studies and examples of different ways in which one can involve patients in research. So thank you for that. While we wait for questions from the audience, uh, I 
I invite all the audience uh, to please post in your questions in the chat box. And uh, while that goes on, maybe I can start off with a few questions. Um, I have a very simple question to start with, actually. So in your interaction with patients um, in India, so are there any discussions about research at all? I mean, is this something that is uh, talked? I mean, I I'm sure people with some conditions like rare diseases and all probably talk about new treatments. Cancer probably is an area where there's a lot of talk about new treatments. But um, is there any talk on research as such? And are people in, in, in people in India even aware that they can enroll themselves for clinical trials and uh, in research? Uh, so I think uh, on that, I think there is some awareness, but I don't think there is uh, enough conversation, right? I don't think we still have people who um, kind of come forward and say, I've been part of a clinical trial. And it's not just, you know, kind of the lay person, right? I mean, uh, the one thing that I often say is in India, even if a doctor or a researcher has been part of a clinical trial, nobody steps forward to say that I've been part of it. Um, so I think that's something that, um, you know, more work needs to be done, more conversations around that need to be done. And also in terms of the main, I, I always come back to, if you watch any, um, you know, kind of a TV serial, which is set in the US, um, somewhere along the way, if there's a person with a condition, and this was, I mean, in fact, if I go back, way back, 20 years ago, Law and Order had one of the characters whose wife uh, has multiple sclerosis and he talks of her being part of a support group and getting support. Um, along the way, you now have enough cases where somebody will say, have you considered a clinical trial uh, for your condition, right? So I think those conversations are shown in mainstream media, which make it much more acceptable. And we don't see that. I think the only... Uh, conversations on clinical trials. I did a little search on that and I found only movies which showed uh, how patients' trusts were, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, taken advantage of for a clinical trial. So it's, it's the Robin Cook type rather than, uh, you know, a normal conversation. Yeah, so I think, that's... yeah, we have a, a long way to go. Yeah, very, very unfortunate. <laughs> um, yeah, so that brings us, I think, to my next question and a conversation that you and I uh, keep having on a regular basis. Um, so this access to information, right? I think one of the challenges, I mean, you've talked about challenges from patients' perspectives, but I think a big challenge in the country is not having access to information. And even for someone like me, if I could talk about my own experience, um, even for someone who is in research, I didn't really uh, know where to go to find information about clinical trials that were happening in the country for my, uh, you know, for my for my father who was suffering with uh, Parkinson's plus uh, syndrome. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, so what do you think can be can be done to uh, improve that? I mean, how do researchers and patient advocates uh, collaborate on this to? make a difference and uh you know because i think i was very naive when i first presented this to you and i said hey we need to do an awareness campaign we should go talk to all the patients tell them why they need to be part of clinical research and then you then pointed out and you said then what okay fine <laughs> but then then what then where do they go right and that's such a crucial question like uh and we also talked during our conversations that in western countries like in us you would see uh, that the clinical trials are recruiting, you would see adverts for them in trains and in public transport and in newspapers. And um, whereas we actually don't see any conversations happening around this um, in the country at all. So uh, any any views on that? Yeah, so I think it is, um, it is really, I mean, we've talked of this, that the website which is there does not, is not patient friendly and whether it is researcher friendly is not for me to answer. Um, we've had that conversation. I think everybody agrees on it, but the question is what's going to be done about it. Uh, but I think also, again, the point of patient engagement in research is to not just be part of a clinical trial, but to be able to be part, to design and co-design the clinical trial. So I think we 
should try and focus that in a discussion on how that is possible. But you're right that unless people are aware of, you know, research in general, um, how do you, and I, I think we just need to um, put together a campaign on both on pushing for the changes that need to be done uh, so that people can find the information, but also in terms of, uh, uh, I, I mean, we did that, right? During COVID, there was a fair amount of conversation around uh, research and then it again died away completely. So I think we need to make sure that there is constant conversation. We need to engage with the health, uh, um, uh, the health reporters and make sure that they are covering some of these uh, research programs that are happening. Um, and also, I think the moment patients, researchers start to leverage patient groups and patient, you know, some of that will spread through that channel as well. And that's an interested channel. So I think it's worth looking at. And sometimes we will say that, I mean, for instance, there are very few, we've had this conversation, there are very few or pretty much no, um, support groups for, um, you know, eye-related conditions in India, right? So while there are NGOs that service, uh, um, kind of provide services for uh, patients to prevent blindness, but they're not really a support group. So that's something that anyway, we are actively looking at how we can um, support and initiate uh, a support group on, uh, say, retinal disorders or something. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have an audience question. Uh, Nisha uh, Venugopal, she's from uh, Indo-US Organization for Rare Diseases, and their mission is to drive patient-focused drug development and patient-centric research to accelerate access and R&D to orphan therapies. Very important work. And uh, her question is, what are your thoughts and experience in engaging with healthcare providers about patient-reported outcomes in India? So I would want to know, because I tried to find out what's happening in this space and I didn't get too much. Uh, I know that there is some work happening at the moment on uh, patient reported outcomes in a few hospital settings. So I think there is a project going on, but again, there, um, they, um, they have an ethics committee and they have a lay person in the ethics committee, but they don't actually have uh, an eye have to say that I did not succeed in that one conversation. I think it was already late. They'd already got the, uh, you know, it had gone through the ethics committee and then they said, we can't now add a patient into the committee that is already working. Um, so I think that is still one of the issues that uh, most, uh, most projects in this area in India are not starting by, it's not the default position that we should include patients in these committees right from the beginning. I think it is something that um, I'm finding that when you bring it up, there are a few places where, it, where they're starting to say we will make it a default, but otherwise it's something like, okay, maybe once it's ready, we will, you know, we can run it through a few patients. You know, so it's it's a bit like that at the moment rather than saying we want patients to be engage right through the process. Nisha, does that answer your question? And yes, if you have ideas on how we can do this, uh, happy to you know engage on it and uh, Yeah, Nisha, we, we are happy for you to unmute yourself and share your uh, you know your experiences if you'd like to. Thanks, Punari. Thank you, Aparna. It was a wonderful talk and uh, so refreshing and insightful to hear this in the Indian context. Uh, like I said, our mission is to build collaborations between the East and West uh, to bring learnings from either side so as to drive patient-focused uh, development and ultimately accelerate access to therapies in, for rare disease patients. And what we have seen is uh, similar to what you said, uh, there is a reluctance to include the patient voice uh, and what it's what is usually being said is that the data is not going to be of as high quality as would be needed uh, for any kind of results or outcomes that are being reported. Uh, but I feel uh, the scenario is slightly changing, and so we are hopeful. And yes, it's a it's a longer conversation, and we'd love to engage with you uh, for this. Sure. Thank sure. you. Thanks.
Okay, so if I can maybe make a, a follow up uh, comment to that about you know that they think that the uh, that the quality of the study will <laughs> probably uh, you know come down if uh, they start taking in all of the. I think so. That's a very real problem that I think that we see right. I mean, not just here. I think everywhere in the world because there is definitely a knowledge asymmetry in one sense that you know all of these researchers are of course they're academically trained. They have these spe specific skill sets, you know, that is that is required for uh, research. And then, you know, you're bringing in a lay person and who will not have those kind of insights. Uh, insights. Of course, they bring in a very different kind of knowledge. They bring in their lived experience, which I think is a very, um, you know, very powerful uh, knowledge that they bring to the table. But I guess then there needs to be, I mean, how do you think this gap can be bridged? I mean, I think there needs to be training on both sides, right? I mean, there needs to be training. Uh, I mean, you can't just bring a patient into this and say that, okay, you contribute because then they don't have the necessary instruments to contribute. And at the same time, the researchers who are not used to engaging with patients can also, I mean, some of them might be, but majority of them will not know how to actually turn these uh, important, uh, you know, lived experiences of patients into insights that can have a bearing on the research question that they're asking. So how, I mean, do you have any insights on how you think uh, uh, sure. this bridge can be, I mean, this yeah. gap can be bridged? Yeah, so I think that's where, I mean, even if you look at, um, you know, the countries where they have made progress, it didn't happen overnight, right? So they did have, um, they had organizations that helped bridge that gap. And that's the gap that we're trying to, uh, bridge, you know, bridge as well. Um, as you said, there is obviously, uh, you know, there may be some need for training of patients, but on the other hand, you could also look at the patient population um, is a wide population, right? So it's not as though we somehow think of a patient as, I mean, you could have, for instance, a doctor who's been a patient, or you could have, I still remember one conversation in a patient advisory board where I had, there was this guy who was a professor at one of the IITs or ex-professor now. And that was his biggest grouse that, you know, I get treated as though I am, you know, the same as a, and I'm not being elitist here, and I don't think he was being elitist, but, you know, I'm, I'm not the same as uh, uh, the, the farmer from uh, a place, right? So as somebody who has, uh, who is a professor from an IIT, I can understand the science. So if you, you know, if you, uh, so the, the pool is large uh, as, so, you know, the, if you actually make the right effort to uh, find the right uh, resources, you can uh, bring in the right people. And the second thing I think is always, we, I mean, the information asymmetry is both ways, right? So if I look at it and say, look, the researchers don't really know the lived experience. And when you look at the whole journey of a patient, if you're looking at what is meaningfully important to the patient or the caregiver, then you have to look at those elements which researchers or clinicians may not know about. So I think that's that's another way to look at it and say, why do we only think of information asymmetry as, uh, you know, at patients being at the other end? If you look at it, if 95% of the care is happening outside the clinical arena, then there's a wide asymmetry on the reverse as well. So I, th I right. think it really is about being willing and, and not just for research, but you know, Paul Farmer said this, right? You have to be willing to meet the patient uh, where they are. And I think that again, it comes back to it. So if you are coming up with something um, and if you can't explain it in terms that patients can understand, then, um, then how will that explanation be given eventually for shared decision making at the treatment level? So I, th I think we also have to look at it in terms of changing the landscape of how healthcare is executed right down the line, right? So if you're looking to things like shared decision making, um, then you realize that if they don't understand now, then they're not going to understand later as well. Right. So I, I, I Anyway, so I hope yes. that answers. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, but I, I, I think my question comes uh, for, as a researcher, right? I mean, I'm talking about the involvement of patients uh, in like, you know, uh, at the earlier stages of research where we're talking about their involvement in uh, sort of taking their inputs in, uh, you know, the protocol development, for example, or how the study is designed. Uh, someone needs to mute themselves. The study is designed and, you know, I mean, the study design, the protocol, I mean, those kind of technical aspects, I think, I, I mean... Uh, I also think that, you know, people with lived experiences have useful insights, even in those uh, aspects that it is not just about making, you know, the jargon more layman friendly or how do they disseminate information? How do it is not just that, right? There is also a lot of um, a lot of value in uh, taking patient insights in the research process itself. And I think my Correct. question stemmed from that, that, you know, I mean, I, I like you said, it cannot happen overnight, and there needs to be uh, then it, it there needs to be handholding. There needs to be some kind of training. And uh, are you aware of any such uh, 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 you know training programs or resources that are available? So that, I think uh, again in the Western world there are a few. You particular uh, Europe has a few training uh, things, but I think also what happens is that over time, especially if you don't treat them as one-off exercises and they're going to be part of a long project over time they learn, right? So if you've got people who committed to this, uh, then they do learn. Yes, you will have some who will, you know, and we've had this uh, in certain conditions, uh, you have to factor in that they may or may not be around for long periods of time. Uh, but in others, uh, uh, they, they are around and they continue to learn. And we also are exploring, um, for instance, and not related to research, but um, you know, for the clinical guidelines committee, uh, where we brought in patients, uh, we're now looking at how, if we were to, um, kind of, uh, and I think Nilima and Dr. Na uh, Raja are aware of that, is if they are also uh, trained in, say, a health economics course, then, you know, does that change their outlook uh, for future discussions, right? So there are um, aspects, so depending on the work stream, we can look at what uh, you know, training or facilitation. Uh, and maybe initially it will also, you know, there will need to be facilitation to make sure that um, they feel confident or comfortable in raising their points of view as well. And similarly, clinicians or researchers feel um, comfortable navigating that, right? So because also what we found is that because it can be sometimes these conversations can be emotional, um, researchers or clinicians then don't know how to deal with that, right? And then, um, so do you do you kind of dig further? Do you back off completely? Uh, and that's something as well that comes back to, uh, you know, again, uh, so that's something we do as well is helping people navigate those discussions. Um, and I think coming back, even in terms of protocol, right, uh, we found that people, uh, patients, so in the examples that, were out there, um, there were examples of people saying that, look, if I've had severe hypoglycemia, I will remember it, uh, you know, two weeks later. But if I've had mild hypoglycemia, then I won't uh, remember those cases. So if we need to capture those, then you'll need to do a, a daily, you know, one minute update on an app or on, on something. Uh, but if you expect me to remember two weeks later, I won't remember that. So, you know, there are those kind of inputs that come in or somebody who says uh, there are others who say, um, in, in not, you know, that having a good day, I don't want to sit and update these things. Right. So um, you also have to factor that in mind that if you're designing a trial, which is expecting people to input information, when should they put in? How do you prompt it? There was one study where it said that. Um, it was when somebody came into a clinic and location of that screen, the touch screen for uh, that input was a factor because uh, uh, if that touch screen was on the way out, most patients did not put in. If the waiting time was longer, they went and put in. Uh, uh, and as they entered, you know, it, it was, I mean, it was in part of their part of the way, then they input. So there are so many factors that come in uh, where again, Again, that input from the patients in that early design, because you will face that in the in the actual uh, study. 
Uh, but if you bring in the patients early on, you'll get those inputs later, right? So, I mean, earlier. So ultimately, you will end up having uh, what we're, they're finding is that you get at least, I think, between some studies show 15% improvement, some studies show 18% improvement, uh, and some, I think, higher. So they've been trying to figure that out, but I think that data is not yet fully standardized. So there is improvement in um, retention of people and also recruitment, as I said, I think both leveraging both the standard uh, protocols of recruiting as well as the uh, patient networks uh, seems to uh, make a big difference as well. So I think coming back to your point, I think um, there will be elements uh, and again, there will be effort needed to bring in the initially at least bring in people who are uh, and I think it will happen because, you know, if people find that this is too technical for me, then they will not stick on a, in that process, right? They will back off and uh, opt out. Um, and there will be certain studies which will require much more scientific intervention, other studies which will be less about the science. Um, so I think depending on horses for courses, right? So depending on what is required, I think we can find the a right set of uh, patients in the in the process. Right. Yeah. So I think we're nearing the end. Um, so I, any audience have any questions? Please. Uh, uh, yeah. Pyle has a question. Do you feel self-reported questions part in research have high potential for being set correctly when asked twice in two different time frames on same day? Uh, Pyle, do you want to unmute yourself and ask that question? Um... As Dr. Aparna mentioned, ki when we are uh, keep on asking patients multiple times, then we can get to know if they have a mild symptoms or uh, sometimes having symptoms or disease, uh, like mild severity of uh, disease uh, case. So sometimes they miss to, uh, to say about that. So if we repeatedly ask every day or in two different time frame, do you think they will say correctly that yes, they have a disease? So I think, again, uh, there is no fixed answer, right? I think it depends on what it is and what the patient is going through. You can get very annoyed if you keep getting asked the same question multiple times. It's like those diet apps that we've all tried, right? So beyond a point... Uh, you will shut it off uh, all the notifications. So I think it's it's always about finding the right balance for the right. And I think that's where we're finding that what works for uh, diabetes type one doesn't work for you know metastatic cancer uh, may be different for somebody with a chronic uh, eye disease as well. So I think we will. It I mean we know that these will need to be. Uh, there may be some learnings that can be adapted, but otherwise it's going to be, uh, you know, kind of specific to each condition and each scenario. Okay, so uh, any last thoughts, Aparna, before we wrap it up? I mean, for, yeah, for our young researchers uh, who are, you know, uh, who are keen to uh, engage with the uh, patients, what would your message be? I think the key thing uh, really is to go into it with an open mind, right? Uh, do not do not assume that, uh, in fact, I think there was one of these conversations I was listening to. Um, one patient advocate says, I walk into a room and say, I bring down the IQ of the, the room, but she says, I should not actually be saying it, but I say it because then I can, I have the liberty to say, can you explain it to me in layman's terms, right? So, um, and I think that's really what it is. Um, I think I think there is enough evidence now. Um, and, you know, since you're researchers and it's about evidence, um, there is enough evidence which says that this is uh, proven beneficial across the world. And there is no reason why uh, India should be an outlier on this. Um, I think it's important to dive in. Try with different things. There are different approaches. You could try uh, bringing in patients as co-investigators. You can try patient panels. You can try validating your instruments with you know, a patient advisory board. Um, there, 
you could use social media. I don't know what the guidelines are and why we never announce, uh, uh, you know, kind of clinical trials on uh, social media. But, you know, that's something that we can figure out if there's any res uh, restrictions. Otherwise, we should be seeing what can be done about it. Uh, and I think we just have to try different things and figure out what works uh, in the long run. Otherwise, I think we will keep uh, assuming that it won't work and not make any progress. See, Dr. Raja Dr. is Raja, here yes. now. <laughs> uh, Dr. Raja, any, any comments from a clinician's perspective? No, thanks uh, very much, Aparna. I just wanted to check with you, are you seeing any uh, increase in involvement from clinicians or pharma with you or your groups, like-minded groups in the last few years or are we still at a stage where we are just talking? Are you seeing any change? In the I think we're starting to see, yeah. So we are at least seeing um, post, uh, um, I guess, post uh, um, implementation of post uh, rollout, we're seeing some patient pan advisory boards uh, that pharma is wanting to understand patient behavior uh, for understanding their protocols for adherence strategies, et cetera. Um, we are seeing, um, in fact, I think I had a conversation with National Cancer Grid, Dr. Manju, she was saying that they probably are going to um, put patient participation as uh, uh, you know, kind of into the requirement for uh, approvals of uh, research. Um, so I think that's something that is coming up uh, as well. Um, I think, and in fact, uh, I think Sheetal is the next month part of one of those uh, credo workshops that they run. Um, I, I So I think we are seeing a little bit of that. Uh, WHO, there's a couple of NIHR grants, but that's not so much yet on research. It's more on, uh, uh, you know, the communication uh, when you're living with the uh, NCT. Um, so I think that's where we are seeing. I don't know, Dr. Raja, if you are seeing uh, other stuff. Uh, I think the industry definitely does want to see more of it. Um, but whether the medical associations and other research organizations are moving in that direction. I'd like to hear from you as well. Yeah. So uh, while I'm hearing from other panelists and you know, they're trying to be more patient centric, but I haven't heard any specific examples increasing, you know, from a clinician's perspective. But from my side, I can see that we are engaging with you more often than earlier. So <laughs> that's a good thing. Yeah. But thank you so much for bringing in your perspective. Right. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Aparna, for that. Uh, you know, that was a very interesting and insightful conversation. Thank you so much for sparing your time. And thank, thank you. you. And I hope thank to you. see, you know, research proposals coming where we're asking for patients to be part of the co-design process. So. <laughs> yes, yes. Sure. We will definitely push for that at LV Prasad at least. Right. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you. thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to talk about this as well. Um, and thank you to I Hope and Elvi Prasad. Thank you. Thank you all. Goodbye. Yes. Bye.